Um, I'm Tamara Hedges. I'm the executive director here at the UCR Palm Desert Center. And um, it, it's, uh, it's a pleasure not only to be here with all of you, but to be here with our speaker tonight, Dr. Cameron Barrows, my colleague, and we'll get to him in just a moment. First off, I would like to remind everyone this is being recorded. And that's great because if your pizza delivery comes or if uh, the dog needs to go out for a little break, you can get up and you can catch the part that you missed on our YouTube channel uh, when you have time to view that. So don't worry if you miss a little bit here. We'll have uh, time for questions at the end and you can put those questions into the Q&A at any time. Use the chat for chatting in the Q&A for the questions so that we can stay organized. Um, Colin Barrows will be conducting the chat, facilitating that for us. Speaking of Colin, I wanna thank Colin and I wanna thank Maggie Downs and Amy O'Neill, Cameron Barrows and Elizabeth Ogren Erickson. They are, along with myself, a part of the, we make up the Wild Coachella planning team. Oh, and I, and I can't forget Dr. Lynn Sweet as well. So thank you planning team for these lectures. You may have noticed we were doing these very regularly on the third uh, or the, the Thursday, the first Thursday of every month. And we had to take a little break because well, life happens and many of our speakers that we had been talking to and had lined up had um, circumstances where they couldn't make it. So we're sorry about that, but we are back and we have a lineup of really fascinating speakers starting with tonight's. Before we get started into Dr. Cameron Barrows, I want to thank the UCR Palm Desert Center partners for all that you do to support our programming. There are many ways you can support us, lots of different options in terms of giving levels and programs to support. So if you're not a partner, please check us out. We can put that information in the chat and become a partner tonight. We would love to have you. Okay, so um, without further ado, I would like to um, introduce Dr. Cameron Barrows, our friend and our colleague. He's a research ecologist emeritus now. He retired uh, October the 1st of uh, 2021, but he is definitely still around and we're so grateful for that. I'm going to read a little bit about Dr. Barrows. His research focuses on the impacts of environmental change in desert systems at scales that include populations, communities, habitat, and landscapes. Those changes may include land use, invasive species, habitat fragmentation, severing landscape connectivity, and climate. One theme of his ecological research is the importance of a foundation of natural history. In many areas of academia, natural history perspectives and skills are being lost. His goal is to continue to provide that foundational approach as an essential tool for addressing complex ecological questions. Finally, an, addition, an additional direction in Dr. Barrow's research is to engage local non-academic volunteers as community scientists. In doing this, in addition to the data, the data that they collect, th those volunteers become advocates for science and conservation. He is also the lead instructor for our California Naturalist and Climate Steward programs, generously donating his time to both of these important community education efforts. We are so grateful to Dr. Barrows for being here with us tonight and sharing his knowledge and expertise. Welcome, Dr. Barrows. Well, thank you, Tamara. Um, let's see if we can get started here. Tamara or Agam, you need to allow me to um, share my screen. There we go. Excellent. So again, welcome everyone. Um, good evening. And I'm going to give you a talk about the horned lizards that live in our local deserts and, and just what's going on with their populations with respect to a lot of things, but not the least of which is climate change. 
So first of all, just to start out with some arcane information, um, the genus of horned lizards is Phrynosoma. Phrynosoma means toad body. And if you think about it, that's kind of what they look like. You can, if you look at these two pictures, the one on the left is a horned lizard. This is the greater short horned lizard. And the one on the right is a toad. And they look kind of similar. Um, the one on the left is got a neck and got a tail. The one on the right doesn't have a neck, doesn't have a tail, and is an amphibian. So they're actually quite different. So sometimes I take a little bit of cringe when somebody says horny toad, but at least the Greek for phrynosoma means toad body, so it makes sense. But I'll tell you the one thing that really makes me cringe is when universities use this species or this group of species as their mascot. And so TCU has what they call the horned frogs. So obviously the mascot that you see there is not a frog. It's got a tail and it's got a neck. So this is a horned lizard. Um, and I, I sometimes try to imagine them trying to um, encourage their team on the court by saying, go horned frogs. Um, doesn't make sense to me. They're, horned lizards are about the most calm and non-aggressive species you can imagine. So we'll go from there. But that, again, just a little bit of a cringe thing going there. There's 17 species of rec recognized species of horned lizards in the, the North America right now. That's the only place they occur. And they only occur to the west of the Mississippi River. And you can see this is a map that shows all 17 of them. There are, it's two different maps just to get all 17 of them on the same map. Um, mostly in the United States portion, they occur in very arid areas. But down into Mexico, there is a couple of species that enter into the tropical or subtropical areas as well. So they occur in a lot of different habitats. The, from a science standpoint, what's really interesting about them is they all do the same thing. They all look the same way. They, um, they all are eat ants. That's their primary diet. And, and from the standpoint of science, it means that there's fewer variables that you have to consider when trying to figure out why they do what they do or where they are. They eat ants. They're low to the ground. They um, blend in with the environment very well. Um, and usually they don't overlap with any other horned lizard. When there's one species of horned lizard there, there is usually never a, another one there. So, well, I'm going to show you, this is what is called a phylogeny, phy, phylogeny. And I just wanted to point out because one of the species here, the um, flat-tailed horned lizard has the longest horns of any horned lizard known so far. The other two that we're going to look at, which is the desert horn lizard up there and the Blainville's horn lizard down there, have intermediate size horns. So one question you could ask is, why do they need horns? And the pretty clear answer is that they use their horns to avoid being eaten. Now, when I've held horn lizards, especially the flat-tailed horn lizard, if I put my hand anywhere near its horns, it'll try to jab me with their horns. And it, they've even drawn a little bit of blood in my thumb. So they're sharp horns and they're, they're really good. At, so you can imagine any way of uh, maybe a snake or something grabbing it and, and the horned lizards start jabbing it pretty hard with those horns. So that's one reason to have horns. Another reason is just, it's really hard to swallow them. Um, hard to you know get a, a snake mouth around them. And if a snake does swallow them, it often gets stuck in their throat and that's the last horned lizard they'll ever eat. So it seems to work out pretty well. Horned lizards have a lot of other interesting adaptations. Some of them will squirt blood out of their eye to um, actually cause a predator to throw the, them out of their mouth. There's a, a friend of mine named Wade Sherbrooke who's been doing this kind of research and he's found that they won't squirt out the blood out of their eye unless it's um, some human who's bothering them. But if, if it's like a coyote or a fox or a, a, a bobcat, they won't squirt the blood until the animal puts them right into their mouth. And they squirt the, the blood right into the roof of the mouth. And immediately, 
within less than a second, the animal starts foaming at the mouth and they spit out the horned lizard. The horned lizard can walk away unharmed and the coyote or the bobcat or the um, fox spends another half an hour or so trying to get the foam out of its mouth and then walks away and it's not harmed either. But they never eat a horned lizard again. They learn very quickly from that. So there's some really interesting adaptations that they do to avoid becoming somebody's dinner. Now here's an example of just one species and how variable they can be. This is the desert horned lizard. And they match the color of their environment usually very, very well. You can imagine if they don't match it, then they, because they're slow moving and they, they really would prefer just sitting still rather than running away, that if they didn't match their environment, they would be easy prey for maybe a, a bird or um, some other animal. But they blend in so well and then they stay very still and you can walk right past them and never see them. The desert horn lizard is especially good at matching its environment. And I, I want to make it clear that they don't change their color when they change, move to a different type of habitat. They're born with the color they're born with, but those that are born in that area or hatched in that area um, who don't match their environment become somebody's dinner pretty quickly. And those that do match their environment have a long and happy life. And so there is natural selection that favors them to match their environment quite well. You can see in the map here that the desert horned lizard is true to its name is found throughout the Colorado desert, the Mojave desert, and up into parts of the Great Basin Desert. I've even found them in central Nevada in, in some of the um, Great Basin habitats up there. But again, just appreciate how well they blend in with their environment, especially a couple of these pictures like this one and this one, how if I didn't tell you there was a horned lizard there, you might not see it at all, which is what they're after. They're trying to get you to walk on by and, and not even recognize that they're there. The second horned lizard that we're going to talk about is called Blaineville's horned lizard. And some of you who have been following herpetology for a while would have originally known this as the coast horned lizard, but the coast horned lizard got separated by its genetics into three different species, four different species. Um, and they occur all the way from Fresno all the way down into the tip of Baja, California, all, but separating by species all the way down. The Blaineville's horn lizard is restricted mostly to California and just a little bit into Northern Baja, California and the, up like down to about Ensenada, but they don't get much further down than that. And again, you can see they blend in with their environment pretty well as well. Um, these guys can be just doing it. One, a couple of things. One is that they, there's a big space between the two horns and there's a little horn in the middle. And that's one way you can tell them apart. And then the other is that they have two rows of spines along their side right there. That's another way that you can tell them apart. Um, again, their map is all the way up even past Fresno, even up to Sacramento, down along the coast. But there is this little part of their range that includes the desert. They go into Joshua Tree National Park and into our local mountains, into the San Jacinto and Santa Rosa Mountains, um, and then head off again down to about Ensenada here. The last one that I'm going to show you right here is the flat-tailed horned lizard. This probably is my favorite one. They live on our dunes here in the Coachella Valley. And you can see that they also do a pretty good job of blending in. You can see this picture right here. They cover themselves with sand, so they virtually become in, um, it, invisible. And you can see that this one is doing that as well. But otherwise, they blend in very well. This species is distinguished. One, as I mentioned before, they have the longest horns of any of the horned lizards. And then they have this dark line that goes down their back. But the other thing is that they live on the edge of sand dunes, not necessarily in the middle of sand dunes, but on the edge of sand dunes. And most of the other horned lizards just don't find that as good habitat at all. Um, you can see there, they have one of the smallest ranges of any horned lizard in North America. You can see a picture of it down here. Again, mostly they have this dark line down their back, but every once in a while you get one that doesn't have that, and that's this one right here. I've heard some people say that the dark line on the back is supposed to mimic shadows of plants, like you can see in this middle picture. And so it just looks like there's another shadow falling on the ground there. And so 
a, a potential predator doesn't see them at all, usually. Um, here's a map of their original distribution. And you can see they occurred all the way up from the Coachella Valley down um, and get into the northern part of ba um, Baja California and um, the Sonora area. And again, mostly in around sand dunes, not necessarily on the sand dunes themselves. This is a species that's really lost a lot of its habitat. This is closer to its distribution right now, but even the little blue um, polygons that I'm showing here are really overestimating the real extent because they most of that habitat is no longer suitable. But here in the Coachella Valley, where I'm um, putting the pointer right now, is the most northernmost and most westernmost population, and it's completely fragmented now from the rest of the other areas. This is a species that's been proposed as being a threatened species multiple times, both at the federal level and the state level. And um, every time they've done that, it has not happened. They've, they've not been able to be successful in getting it listed as threatened or endangered, primarily for political reasons. And, and we'll get into that in just a second. Um, this is a closer look at their habitat. Up here is where you'd find fringe-tailed lizards, but down here and out into here is where the flat-tailed lizard calls home. So they're in the flat areas and um, our, this is a picture of the dunes here in the Coachella Valley. This is one of the reasons I like them so much is that they're eas the easiest horned lizard to find because they leave tracks in the sand and I can walk out in the sand in the morning after a windy evening and follow each of the tracks. And at the end of the track, there's always a horned lizard. Um, all the other horned lizards live in gravelly or rocky areas and they're hard to find because they don't leave tracks and they blend in so well with their environment. This is kind of a cartoon that I put together to um, depict the Coachella Valley. Now the valley of course is down here this is Joshua Tree National Park, and the, the scale off to the right here is in meters, and it was, it's meters above sea level. So the bottom of the Coachella Valley is at sea level, or and sometimes even a little bit below sea level. Here's um, Joshua Tree National Park, and over here is Mount San Jacinto, which is the uh, over 3,000 meters, first of all, but it's also the steepest mountain in North America. That, that slope is steeper than any other mountain there. From this distance, this distance is, it gets to that height faster than any other mountain in the United States. To see, see how these horned lizards distribute themselves. So the, the flat-tailed horned lizards is only found here at the bottom in the sand dunes, or again, near or on the edge of those sand dunes. A little bit above them is the desert horned lizard. Now, I've in the past, there has been a little bit of overlap between where the desert horn lizards and the um, flat-tailed horn lizards occur, but um, it's only lasted for a short amount of time. As soon as it gets gravelly, as soon as it gets rocky, the desert horn lizard takes over. And then above them is the Blainville's horn lizard. And you can see that when you're in Joshua Tree, you're always within the range of at least one of those horn lizard species. But in the San Jacinto and Santa Rosa Mountains, you can get to a point where it's just too tall for them. So anything above maybe this elevation, they're not there anymore. A lot of the habitat concerns we have is that we tend, as a, a species, as humans, we tend to um, think of the desert as a place where nothing lives. And, and it's a place then to do other things, to recreate and, and um, do bold or dune buggies and, and uh, motorcycles and so forth and so on. Um, in this picture, the flat-tailed horned lizards probably live right out in this area here. Um, we're putting solar plants out there, which is good on one hand because we need more solar. Not so good on another because to do this kind of solar out in the desert you are taking away habitat from desert tortoises and flat-tailed horned lizards and desert horned lizards and much, many other species. It's much more efficient to put them on your roof if you can. Um, and then this is the, probably one of the reasons that the flat tail has never been actually listed as threatened because the border wall between Mexico and um, the United States 
had to be built, of course, um, and it had to be managed and maintained and taking a lot of habitat out on both sides, but especially on the with this side over here, which is the US side. And so all of this habitat would have been originally flat-tailed horned lizard habitat. Now here in the Coachella Valley, they're now only found in one tiny location and it's the Coachella Valley National Wildlife Refuge. And you can see it's fragmented from the rest of the dune systems in the Coachella Valley. It's surrounded by development. These are all housing developments. The dark areas are all golf courses. And if you could imagine being here in the 1950s or 1960s, they were found everywhere on the valley floor. They can be found everywhere from um, Windy Point all the way down to Mecca and below. And, and all of those areas, they, they don't occur there at all anymore. And this is the only place left they occur is this tiny, relatively small patch of habitat here. So this is where we've been spending most of our time looking at um, how healthy the population is and what we can do to sustain that population. All of these other patches of sand, the populations are, are either gone or they're unsustainable. We're here, at least so far, they seem to be sustainable. And that's good news. One of the questions we I originally had was whether or not the flat-tailed horned lizards, there was an edge effect, meaning at the edge of the preserve, did they their numbers um, dwindle or were they healthy all the way to the edge of the habitat? And you can see on this graph here, if you understand or read this, is this is meters from the edge. And you can see that the numbers don't sort of stabilize until you get to about 150 meters. Below that, they don't occur, or they're very, very much less common. This was an, a, a difficult question because it's just, well, why would that be? And I thought about it a long time and we looked at ant populations. Again, they eat ants and the ants were actually more common there along the roads. And so that didn't make sense. Um, the habitat looked perfectly suitable. Um, we couldn't figure it out. And so at one point, out of frustration, I put little tiny radios on their backs to figure out where, what they were doing when they did go into that area. So these little tiny radios are smaller than your thumbnail, and, or, fin or little fingernail, not thumbnail, your little fingernail. And um, so I put them on, I think, seven lizards and came out about two days later, and I couldn't find any of them. So you could imagine maybe that one or two of the radios would have failed, but all seven of them failing just didn't make any sense at all. So I spent all, you know, hiking way into the middle of the preserve thinking, or the refuge thinking, well, maybe they, they left no radio signals from there. I went all the way around the, the refuge, no radio signals. And I was very frustrated. And, and we had spent a lot of time trying to get these radios and putting them on them. And it looked like, we had um, basically lost all this data. So one day after in frustration, I forgot and left my radio receiver on and I was driving home. And as I got to this point, all of a sudden the radio receiver started beeping like crazy. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm not anywhere any, near any dunes or any habitat at this point. So I got out of my vehicle and started walking around with the antenna trying to figure out where the, these lizards were, or where the radios were. And it turned out they were all at the top of that palm tree. Now, just to make it clear, horned lizards or any horned lizards, <laughs> horned lizards of any kind do not climb trees, and they certainly don't climb palm trees. What there was was that there was a small falcon called a kestrel that was nesting at the top of that tree. And kestrels are native to California. They're certainly native to our desert, but they don't occur anywhere around the sand dunes because there's no more place, no place for them to nest. They need something like a cliff or a palm tree to nest in. And only because these palm trees were here did the kestrels move in. Doesn't sound like such a bad thing, except for there was nothing to eat in the Sun City Palm Desert development. And so they flew over to the preserve, the, the refuge, and they would sit on the power line and just pick off all of the horned lizards that were any that came anywhere close to them, essentially within 100 to 150 meters. They ate every single horned lizard and carried it back to their nest to feed their babies. So it's okay for horn or kestrels to 
exist and, and to be able to have dinner. But in this situation, they should have never been there unless people planted these trees. And the horned lizards didn't have any way to avoid them because they've lived or evolved in a world that um, kestrels never existed because they could never nest there. So it's kind of a problem. We've talked about what do we do about it? And one solution would be to take out the palm trees, which would be the best solution, but they, the palm or the Sun City people wouldn't think very kindly about that. And another solution would be to trim the palm trees so that there wasn't nesting areas there. And the Sun City people haven't been interested in that either. Um, another way would be to take down the power poles so that the castles didn't have any place to um, sit and, and perch and, and be able to watch for the horned lizards moving. That's probably the best solution, but it's the most expensive one. And so far it hasn't happened. So this ongoing um, degradation of habitat along the edge of the refuge continues to this day. This was something we published quite a few years ago. But the other question I have is this is like one of the hottest places on, on Earth, certainly the hottest place in North America, these deep red co colors you can see. This is Death Valley, but where we are in the Coachella Valley is just about as red. This is indicating just how hot it is. So these animals, especially the flat-tailed horned lizard, are living in an extreme environment. And so one of my questions then becomes, well, if it gets hotter, which it already is, do, do they are they able to continue to sustain their populations if it gets hotter and drier? And so this is a, a graph of the temperatures in the Coachella Valley, and in fact, in Indio. So it's very close to where their habitat is here in the Coachella Valley. And you can see that from the 19 early 1900s all the way to about 1980, there was really no change. This dark line you see is a moving average that you can see here, and and it really there this is annual mean temperature in centigrade, which is about 74, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see that it doesn't change throughout that period. And then in 1980, it changes. It gets more variable. It gets um, less consistent. But overall, it gets much, much hotter. And you can see that this running average gets all the way up to over 25 degrees centigrade. So it's we talk a lot about um, trying to keep the world within 1.5 degrees centigrade warming, or at the very worst, two degrees centigrade warming. And we've already exceeded that here in the Coachella Valley. It's already more than two degrees warming here in the Coachella Valley. So it's definitely hotter here. And this, this next graph talks about rainfall. And it's a way of showing rainfall in a kind of interesting way. If it's below the middle line, it means it's drier than average. If it's above the line, it's wetter than average. And it starts in the early 1920s again. And these, when it's up to about negative one, that means a drought condition. And if it's up to negative two, it means extreme drought. So if you can see that the time span between 1928 to 2000, there were three, or really just two extreme drought periods, just those two right there. But if you look at the period from 2000, all the way up to today, we're already at three. And this year is going to be one as well, unless we get some rain in the next few weeks or months. So we're talking over 75 or 78 years, whatever that we have here, only two extreme droughts. And already in the first 22 years of this century, we've had probably four at this point. And so this consistent, if this trend continues, it's not only hotter, but it's drier. So what does that mean to the flat-tailed horned lizard? They, they, you know, they, some species can move up a mountain and they, they can inch their way up a mountain. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But because the flat-tailed horned lizards are so restricted to the, this edge of the sand dune habitat, they, they can't, there's no habitat like that going up the mountain. They, there's nowhere for them to go. They're stuck down here. So we've been tracking their population, and this is what the population numbers have looked like. This is um, mean lizards per um, tenth of a hectare. And although they go up and they go down quite a bit, they're not consistently going up or down. And so even though it's especially in the 2000s, which you see here, where it's gotten much, much drier, 
and it's gotten much, much hotter, the numbers seem to be more or less stable. Again, we have some um, years where there's more than others, but the numbers seem to be consistent. There's no trend here. We do have some really low numbers. And so I was trying to explain what that what those low numbers meant. But 2005 turned out to be a really wet year. So did 2008, 9, 10, and 11. Those were all wet years. And, um, and those were all low times to, or low population levels for the horn lizards. Whereas the driest years like 2016 and 15 were really dry years, 2002 and 2003 were really dry years. In the last couple of years, 2001, um, two, or 2020, 2021, and, and now 222 seems to be very, very dry as well. And the numbers seem to be much larger. So that's curious. Why would they, their populations appear to be healthier in dry years versus wet years? You would accept, expect just the opposite. Um, this is what their habitat should look like and what it does look like in many um, dry years. But in really, really wet years, it looks like this. It gets overtaken by an invasive plant called Sahara mustard. And Sahara mustard is, as you might guess, from the Sahara Desert and the Mediterranean region of North Africa and so forth. And there, when it arrived here, it arrived here when they brought date palms and it, there were no predators that would eat it. Um, even tortoises won't eat it. They won't, they just ignore it completely. And so there's no, nothing that controls the population. And in wet years, it just takes over the habitat. Um, so you, you can't even see the desert floor. And so you might make a, a reasonable guess is the reason the numbers are so low is because you can't see them. But we, before we do the counts, weeks before we do the counts, we clear out the mustard so we can see the, the floor of the desert, the sandy areas. And so we're, it's not just that we can't find them, it's that they're not, they're actually not there. So that's curious as to why that would be. Um, this is data that I, it, it looks more complicated it is. And the first couple of rows are the fringe tail lizards on the active dunes. And you can see that they have a very positive relationship. The correlation is positive and very significant with rainfall. When there's more rain, there's more lizards. That makes a lot of sense. The fr same fringe tail lizards when they're on the fringes of the habit, the dunes where the flat tails are, there's no relationship whatsoever. And then when you look at the flat tailed horn lizard, there's a very significant negative relationship with the ab abundance of the Sahara mustard, which is Brassica turnifordia. So um, getting rid of the mustard, if we have wet years, is going to be an extremely important thing to sustain this population. The other question is, what are the ants doing? Why aren't they correlating with ants? And so this has been a very frustrating part of this research. And um, one of the fellows that worked for me, um, Scott Hecox and I, tried to figure out how to answer why ants wouldn't be happy to have the mustard there because the mustard has tons of seeds and the, the ants eat the seeds and you can actually see the ants carrying the seeds, the worker ants. So Scott had this idea, we create these little ant farms and we, he would collect newly mated queens. So they didn't have their own colony yet that we could just find them um, walking around the Palm Desert campus actually. And we created these little um, ant farms for them. And for half of them, we fed them just mustard seeds. And the other half, we fed them just native seeds that were not mustard seeds. And the queens that had just mustard seeds never were able to produce um, a brood, meaning they, they never were able to make um, new workers and, and create a colony, but all of the ones that had the native seeds created broods, they had they created workers and they were able to at least initiate the start of their own colony. So that's really interesting, even though the workers would collect the mustard seeds because they look like seeds and they taste like seeds, they apparently were not food. Either they're too hard or maybe they're even toxic to the ants, but that's it, when the mustard's there, the ants populations apparently are very much diminished. So we were able to connect the dots there and figure out why the horned lizards are so um, rare or their populations go so low when the mustard is present. 
but we're going to change gears a little bit and look at some of the other um, two species. And this is the desert horn lizard again. And a while ago, I created a map of using their existing known data of where they occurred in both Joshua Tree, which is this area, the Coachella Valley, which is this area, and the Santa Rosa San Jacinto National Monument right here. So anything that's green here is where they occurred based on the known locations at that point. And this, I put this together about 10 years ago, so it's a, a bit out of date. But it, the model has a lot of variables in it. It's topography and soil conditions and, and sorts of things. But one of those variables is the climate. And so when you have that in the model, you can change that and say, well, let's make that climate variable appear like what it's going to be in the Coachella Valley in this area as a result of climate change. And, and you get a map that looks very different. So the red area is where they occur in a climate change scenario. So red, kind of the pinkish red or salmon red is new areas that are being occupied. The brownish or um, more sepia, or not sepia, but earth tone red is overlap with where they currently occur. But all these green areas are areas that become abandoned, that they're no longer suitable for them in a climate change scenario. The interesting thing for me out of this is that now when we go into Joshua Tree and are looking for desert horn lizards, the place where we find them at their highest densities are areas where they're, if they were there before, it wasn't, the, the model didn't recognize them as good habitat. But today, this is the best habitat. When we go there, we have volunteers that are going back and, and monitoring the populations, especially this population in the Pine City area, but also at the entrance to the park and up here towards Keys View. These populations are doing really well. We, we usually see several different individuals every time we do a survey there, which is a lot given that they are so hard to find and they blend in so well with their environment. But again, abandoning all these green areas because it's just too hot for them. This is the Blainville's horn lizard. Um, again, these are at a higher elevation. You can see that the higher elevations of the park and the higher elevations here in this area. So what happens with climate change with these guys? Well, they don't, there's no longer habitat for them in the park. They're, they're completely extirpated from the park and um, they go to the very highest popular or elevations within the Santa Rosa and Santa Jacinto National Monument and up towards Big Bear, they start climbing up the slope there as well. So that's interesting. And we have to remember these are models. It's not reality. A model, every model you've ever seen in your life is imperfect and some of them are just wrong altogether. And so what we wanted to do is be able to test these models and say, how do we know if they're right or they're wrong or how right they are or how wrong they are? And what happened was a few years ago, um, I was very fortunate. I did my master's degree at Long Beach State. And one of the alumni from Long Beach State gave me a call and he said, we have found this box of data cards in the basement of the biology department at um, Long Beach State. And we want to clear that out because we're going to create new office, office space or something. I'm not sure what they were going to do it, but they were going to throw this box away. And it said Joshua Tree data on the side of the box. And it says, so what's in there? And he goes, I don't know. There's just a bunch of cards in there. So I said, send it to me. And he, he actually brought it all the way out here to the desert and, and gave it to me. And I opened it up and it was records from the 1960s where the, um, they had field classes, which is a wonderful thing that they don't do anywhere anymore, where they brought students out into the desert and showed them the natural history, the animals and plants of the desert. And they, they did that multiple times a year, all through the 1960s. And so the white bars that you see here are the data. And, and so what we see here are, per, the numbers off here are a percentage of the total. So, and this, and the bottom is elevation in meters. And you can see that the Blainville's horn lizards are shifted all the way to the highest elevations in the park. And there's a little, quite a bit of overlap between what we saw be, then and before. So the black bars are from iNaturalist records. This is a um, phone app that you can get, and it's recent records from the, the 2000s. And there's a couple of interesting patterns here. One is that they, the 
horn lizards have almost abandoned or, or certainly reduced their population at these lower elevations within the park. But now they're occupying brand new areas at the upper elevations that they never occurred when the students from Long Beach State were out there in the 1960s. So this is showing a, a dramatic shift from middle to low elevations up to the upper elevations, which is exactly what that model that I just showed you said was going to happen. Same thing is happening here for the horned lizard, the Blainfields horned lizard, but there's nowhere for them to go. They're already right at the top. And so they're sort of um, bouncing against the top of the mountain, but there's no place for them to go. Again, it's very similar to what that model shows us. So we had iNaturalist records, which are recent records, and we had the 1960s records, which were students from Long Beach State. We wanted to then test that just one more time, and, and we weren't able to do it as much with the Blainville's horn lizard because they, the only place you find them is at the top of the mountains um, and the top elevations within the national park. But let's look at it for the desert horn lizard. And so what we've done is we've taken volunteers from the mostly graduates from the um, California naturalist class, but anybody who wanted to be out in the desert and help us do science was were able to join us. And we went out and measured them ourselves. So from 19, 2014, and I, we could continue this to today, but I'm just showing the data that, and again, these are elevations. And you can see that the lowest elevation, these diagonals, um, and the middle elevation, this one, um, 110 to 100, or one, 1,100 to 1,200 meters were where they were most common at the early part of this, but they, we actually saw them move into brand new habitat to this 1,300 to 1,400 meter area in the amount of the, just the recent time that we've been able to watch them here. So again, it's exactly what the model says has happened. They're very rapidly moving into this upper elevation area. So they're dealing with climate change by shifting their population, at least the abundance, the centers of their abundance to higher and higher elevations where it's cooler and cooler. That makes sense. Um, the Blainville's horned lizards don't have anywhere else to go within Joshua Tree, but in the Big Bear area and over here in the San Rosa and San Jacinto Mountains, there's still lots of space that, that they can move into. So the population is doing much better here. Um, and, and so this is how these species are adapting to these um, conditions that we're experiencing all, already. But we can also figure that that's what's going to happen as it gets still warmer and still drier. So it's not all bad news that, that these animals can adapt to these changing environments. Um, for the Blainville's horned lizard in Joshua Tree, it, it is bad news. They're, they have nowhere to go, but just a, a few tens of miles away and going up to Big Bear or into the Santa Rosa Mountains and San Jacinto Mountains, it still looks like they're able to continue to move up the, the mountain that way. The interesting thing there then is what about those flat tail horn lizards? Because they can't climb the mountain. They only can live by those sand dunes. They can only live on the bottom of the, of the valley floor. That becomes an interesting question. And, and I don't have any clear answers to that. I can only tell you that it, from just my observations, I don't have really good data on this yet, but my observations are that the flat-tailed horn lizards are changing their activity patterns. When I used to go out there in the early 2000s, I could find them all day long and track them back to where they were, they were hanging out in the middle of the day, usually in the shade of a, a salt bush or a creosote bush. And more recent in the last couple of years, what they're doing is that they're digging burrows and by nine o'clock in the morning, they're down in that burrow. And so before it even gets super hot, they're avoiding the heat by going down underground and staying underground. And, and it looks like they're becoming more and more a early morning and maybe even a late afternoon species when the temperatures cool off, but they're able to avoid heat. So they're a temperature avoider, but they can't move. They, they can, but they can avoid by going underground and by going more than a few inches underground, they have very good insulation and, and can stay at non-lethal temperatures by doing that, which is really interesting to see how these different species of horn lizards, which otherwise are kind of doing all the same thing. They're in different types of habitat, but they are large-ish flat 
horned lizards that eat ants. They're all doing the same thing, but they are adjusting to climate change in very different ways, which I think is just fascinating. I wanted to acknowledge the volunteers that have helped me. And even mid pandemic, we, when we were masking up to, to do these, they would go out and help me do these surveys. And I'll tell you, it, like I mentioned before, it is really hard to find these horn wizards. But what we find is that by the time the third or fourth or fifth person goes by, the horn lizard kind of loses its nerve and it starts to move at that point. And that's when we start seeing them. So even if I'm in the lead, this is not me in the lead here. This is one of the, my volunteers, Larry Hieronima. But um, the, the, the first person sees most of whatever is out there, of the different species of lizards and, and horn lizards. But even all the way to the fourth or fifth or even sixth, seventh person, they're still contributing to the data set because they're seeing lizards that nobody else saw as we go along here. And so they're really making a huge impact on our ability to do the best science possible. So this is an area um, within Joshua Tree National Park that we do surveys. This is up in the Santa Rosa and Santa Cinta Mountains. This is where we find the Blainville's horn lizard in this montane or chaparral habitat. Um, and I just want to thank, I can't thank my volunteers that work with me enough because without them, we could never have gathered this kind of data. And it's really fun to be out with them. And hopefully they have it, they're having fun being out with me as well. So that's my last slide, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have at this point. Great, thank you for the presentation. And uh, folks, if you have questions, make sure to put them in the Q&A, um, and I will relay them to Dr. Barrows and help answer them. So uh, we had a question early on about um, the impact of climate change on the lizards that we're talking about. And I think you covered that pretty well, but maybe um, if you could sort of use your crystal ball a little bit more <laughs> and um, describe what could be different about the horn lizard uh, habitat sort of business as usual or how horn lizard populations business as usual in hundred years, um, a little bit kind of put a bow on that, I guess. Well, and my crystal ball is as clouded as anybody, so I, I can't, I'm not going to be precise on this, but unless we change the trajectory of climate change, and that by that I mean we, we change how much carbon and other ga um, greenhouse gases that we're producing, um, it's going to continue to get hotter and continue to get drier. And that in itself, it should give everybody pause, but it means that these species like the horned lizards, but all of the animals and plants out there that have the ability to move or have the ability to go underground, well, their lives will be constrained. So the horned lizards will have a shorter and shorter amount of time that they'll be able to go out and forage and find a mate. And at, perhaps there, there's some um, researchers that believe that at some point, there just won't be enough time for them to do both of those essential tasks and they won't be able to survive. The other question, and, and we're experiencing this already in Joshua Tree, is um, there is a limit to these mountains. They don't, they're not infinitely tall. And so how high up the mountain can you go? And so that becomes another question. And, and um, I try to be the optimist. I, 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 I tend to frustrate some of my volunteers who are not optimists all the time and, and because I always think that eventually we're going to get it together and we're going to figure this out and we're going to twist turn around the um, climate change situation and it start going back to the kind of climate that we had when I was growing up. Um, so my crystal ball indicates that the animals and plants are going to continue moving up the mountain until we get smart and as soon as we get smart then they're going to come back down again. Okay, so um, our next question, and you can get as um, into the as specific about this as you like, is a fairly um, interesting question about their sort of challenges that you um, came across when you were um, getting accurate data from all these transects. But sort of what are the, the question is, what are the uh, secondary impacts that affected your ability to get accurate data? So maybe you could just 
talk about sort of what are the variables of the data collection and if you have a good story about a specific challenge that you had or just in general. Well, out on, out on the dunes, there's a lot of variables. If it's windy, I can't find the tracks because the wind blows off the tracks. If it hasn't been windy for even a, a 24 hours, then I'm looking at multiple tracks for multiple days and, and I can't find those guys either. So the only time that um, the tracking works on the dunes is if it is windy during the night and then the wind stops in the first thing in the morning and then there's crisp, fresh sand that I can be able to find the lizards. Um, the good news is that that's typically what happens all spring long. And so it's not rare for me to have the ideal conditions out there. But um, it, by about July or so, the wind just stops blowing at night and, and I can't track the lizards anymore. So that's one variable there. Um, so that's a big deal. Um, the other variables are things like if people have been by or you know um, predators have been by and, and they'll the lizards will go to cover and then I can't find them. But for the most part, especially with the multiple volunteers that work with me and work so well and are just amazing spotters, if they're there and they're on the surface, we'll find them. Good. So that maybe brings up a question if folks are um, seeing these lizards or if they want to contribute to some of this research, what are the best ways for them to do that? Well, there's two ways you can do it. Um, if you're out hiking and you see a horned lizard, the best thing you can do is take a photograph of it and submit that photograph to a um, phone app that's called iNaturalist. And most of you know what it is, but it's a free app that you can download um, from your app store. And um, it's really easy to figure out if you're um, technically adept at all. And if you're not like me, then you depend on people like yourself, Colin, who, who trains all of my volunteers on how to use the app and, and how to be most effective with it. Um, that's the best thing you can do. The other thing to do is take a photograph and just email me the photograph with the coordinates and that would be helpful at all. But all of that data is helpful. Every time you see a horned lizard, if you can take a picture or even just describe the location and, and your but photograph would be the best and send me the, the photograph. And if the photograph has coordinated, coordinates on it, that's great. If it doesn't just um, like a map or a description where you were and I'll figure it out again, all of that data is really, really valuable. And I encourage you all to contribute. Um, but the iNaturalist is the easiest and the, the fastest way to do that. You just um, put the photograph into iNaturalist and, and the app does all the work for you. Great. Um, so there's a, a series of questions here sort of talking about some of the related organisms that are out there and how maybe they're being affected by climate. So the first step is, um, we're talking about horn lizards moving to higher elevations, but uh, the question is about plants. And are we expecting, are you seeing them plants um, moving up uh, generationally? Or um, if, and if so, what is the, they're saying that they're thinking that that's going to take a long time. So what's the sort of time lag there instead of a horn lizard, which is just moving up step by step? Well, so when I say the horned lizards are moving up the mountain, it, it's a little bit of a misnomer or misstatement in the sense that the horned lizard doesn't get up in the morning and say, God, it's really too hot here. I'm going to go to up the mountain where it's cooler because they don't know that it's cooler up there. And once they've established their home range, that's where they're going to stay for the rest of their life. And so the movement happens because of um, differential reproduction that the, the horned lizards at the upper end of their distribution reproduce better and are more successful with reproduction. So there's more babies and then some of those babies disperse a little bit higher. As they grow up, the same thing happens and some of their babies disperse a little bit higher. And so that's how that movement happens. It's not an individual who just looks up at the mountains, sees the snow up there and says, that's where I'm going because it's cooler up there. They don't have that capacity. And it's similar with the plants is that, and, and we're, we're tracking plants as well as the horn lizards. So um, part of the data collecting 
we're selecting certain plants that we think might be particularly sensitive to climate change. And we're, we're seeing exactly the same pattern, even common, common plants like um, desert brittle bush. Um, at the lowest elevations, they're just not reproducing anymore, but they are reproducing very well at the upper elevations. And so there's this incremental shift to higher elevations. We're seeing that with desert mallow, we're seeing it with um, desert sweet bush, we're seeing it with a lot of different species that they're shifting up the mountain that way. So they do it by seed dispersal, not by taking the roots out of the ground and moving, it's all by seed dispersal. So I think inherent in the question is that it's a slow process. And so can they keep up with the rate of climate change? And, and I think that's a really important question. And um, the hope is that they can, but we, do, we won't know that for sure until we, a few more decades from now. Right, so, and then, thinking about um, sort of the in-between species between the plants and the horned lizards, you've got the ants where you know, the ants are surviving on the uh, ants and then being eaten by the horned lizards. So have there been any work to show specifically what the climate effects on ants are? There hasn't, and I, if I was um, able to um, advise a graduate student today who really wanted to um, figure out what's going on with climate change and what's likely to happen, I would say, look at the ants because ants are really ecosystem engineers. They're like keystone species. They're arranging the um, and planting you know, inadvertently the flower seeds and the annual seeds and so forth and so on. They're important food for a lot of animals, not just horned lizards. There's birds and other lizards that eat ants as well. And so as ants go, so does the entire ecosystem. If, if ants disappear, the ecosystem starts to fall apart. So if we could understand what's going on with ants, we would have a much better, clearer crystal ball as to what's happening with climate change. Problem is nobody's asking that question or, or you know, none of the students, the students are looking at different things there. Um, and, and so, I keep hoping that we're going to get that ideal student that's going to come in and say, I, I'm really into insects and I want to know, do something that's relevant to climate change. And that would be the perfect marriage between the ants and that student. OK, our next question is about um, sort of direct impacts of people on horned lizards and whether um, they are getting stepped on since they blend in so well and tend not to move. And um, whether that, if they're changing their active times of day, if that they might come into more conflict, conflict with people as far as um, getting stepped on. Well, I, I'm sure they do get stepped on occasionally. Um, most of the time they'll lert, lose their nerve just before you are about to step on them and then they'll move. Um, so rarely will they just stay still and let you step on them. That, that almost never happens. So uh, although based on what I said already that they tend to sit still and, and blend in, you would assume that that happens. It really doesn't. If you get really close to them, um, they will at that last second, they'll move. And so that doesn't happen too often. And I think the change in their, dis their, their timing of activity shouldn't affect that very much. I think that that should be fine. Good question though. Good, and um, next question is about the, so we have described the flat-tailed horned lizard population in the Coachella Valley Reserve. Um, what about some of their other populations further south in uh, the Imperial Valley? Are there people looking at those as well and seeing similar effects or different effects? Well, there they are doing general surveys um, down in those areas. They were doing more of them before that last decision not to list them as threatened or endangered. Leading up to that decision, there was a lot of surveys going on. But unfortunately, um, counting lizards can tell you if the numbers are high or low, but it doesn't really answer those questions as to what causes the lizard populations to go up and go down. And it's sort of that, um, that difference between 
doing just management and saying, okay, I've been told I have to count the lizards, so I'm counting the lizards and here's, here's the data and then doing science. And when you're doing science, you're asking a question and the question should be something like what is causing the numbers to go up some years and not other years and, and, and go down in some years. And unfortunately, the, the folks that have been working down there haven't been asking those questions. So I can only assume that these things are happening. I, I know that the Sahara mustard is down there and, I, and I'm sure that it's having a similar impact, but to my knowledge, nobody is actually studying those relationships. There are some folks associated with the Okatia Wells uh, off-road vehicle area, which is um, within Anza Brago Desert State Park. And they do annual surveys there and are able to show that the, the, even though that there's off-road vehicles in part of the area, the areas where they do the surveys are more peripheral to where the off-road vehicles are, from what I've been told anyway, and, and they are finding the relatively stable numbers there. Yeah, I'll um, add just anecdotally, I did a survey um, or a biological monitoring um, work on one of the marine bases down in uh, the Imperial Valley, um, looking at black elk horn lizards. And it's a place where nobody really ever drives. It's like a barely used area of the base and um, a totally um, road, totally in disrepair. And I've never seen more flat-tailed horned lizards there anywhere in my life than on that day. Um, so anecdotally, <laughs> they're doing just fine on that road because there's nobody there to bother them and there's no Sahara mustard or anything like that coming in. Nice. There's nothing, there's no power lines, there's nothing. So. Good to know. Um, we also have not a question, but an anecdote, which made me think of um, Story I've also heard. Anytime I talk about horn lizards with people, especially people who've been in Southern California for a long time, they always talk about how they used to play with them when they were kids and they were everywhere, very common, especially the, the Blaineville's horn lizards. And there's a comment here from somebody who grew up in Monrovia uh, during the 1970s and saw them very often and um, hasn't seen one since, uh, since about 2004, it sounds like. And um, I also have read records of or accounts of people who went through uh, Southern and Central California on horseback, you know, on um, expeditions looking for natural history. Uh, even before that, you know, 100 years ago in the early 1900s and late 1800s, and just seeing hundreds, if not thousands, of horned lizards from the horseback of the, as they went through the Central Valley. Um, and obviously it seems to be very different from that. Can you um, talk a little bit maybe what about what are the reasons for that might be? Sure, um, there's two things going on. Um, the Blaineville's horned lizard before modern um, or European folks moved into Southern California would have gone right down to the edge of the ocean um, on bluffs overlooking the ocean that their habitat extended all the way down there. Even though there are high elevation species in the desert, it's cool enough that they can exist all the way down again to the forest or to the ocean bluffs above the ocean there. So if you imagine what those areas look like now, there's almost no open space left anymore. It's, it's all houses and shopping malls and so forth and so on. So most of that habitat has been lost that way, but there's something more insidious than that, and that is that even the areas that are left open but are surrounding those developed areas, because of an invasive ant called, um, there's two of them, one is the Argentine ant and the other is the um, red ant, um, and both of those are from Argentina or South, South America, and they were introduced into the United States probably with potted plants and they have taken over areas that are either irrigated or close to irrigated areas. So people, um, researchers I know who have studied this have looked at, they've had captive populations of the Blaineville's horn lizard and they feed them these non-native ants and they, the horn lizards will starve to death without eating these ants. They, either they don't like the flavor, they don't, they don't the, the ants behave in a different way or they sting in a different way, whatever it is, they will starve to death if 
they don't have their native ants, which are primarily harvester ants. And the unfortunate and most insidious part of this is as these non-native ants come in, they push out the native ants. And so there are these huge swaths of land that are maintained in open space for wildlife and for nature, but the non-native ants have moved into them. And as a result of that, the native ants, the, the harvester ants are gone. And as a result of that, there's nothing for the horned lizards to eat. And so they're gone as well. Okay, so we, uh, let's see, there's a clarification question about um, getting stepped on. And the question was, I guess, more about the uh, animals that are estivating just underground. So they're not able to see people coming and move. Um, right. So if they're just underground and they're uh, doing that, being underground at different time periods or not being active at different time periods, might there be an effect there? Um, so the, the pictures I showed you of the dunes there, um, those dunes are not available for people to go out hiking on. And so that wouldn't be a problem there, even though the lizards might be only at just a few centimeters or even less below the sand surface. Um, when I go out there and I, I bring the volunteers out there to do surveys, we are very careful and, and don't, we don't walk on air areas that are very careful where we walk. So that shouldn't be a problem there. Um, otherwise, both in the dunes and elsewhere, when they do burrow in the ground, they, they go fairly deep. And so you could step on a burrow without collapsing it, I think. So I don't see that as a big, big problem. I think it would be a problem probably if you were on a horse that has those sharp hooves. And of course, horses weigh much, much more than human beings. But um, with soft soled shoes and the average weight of a human being, it probably isn't a, a huge problem. All right, um, and let's see. Uh, there's a bunch of really specific and good questions that I don't know if we'll have a chance to get to, but I think I'll pick maybe one of these and let folks know that if they have further questions, they can um, get in touch with you by email and ask questions or uh, take uh, the California naturalist class or um, any of these ways to learn more about horned lizards. Um, but a, a good question here to wrap up on, I think, is um, we're talking about how these lizards may be adapting to climate and to changes in their environment through invasive um, ants and invasive plants, all these kinds of things. Is there any evidence that they might be changing their um, diet? Is it, you know, they're eating only ants at this point. Is there um, any evidence that they might be increasing their um, diversity of the things they eat or changing the things they eat? Um, not yet. Um, at this point, when we find their scats on the ground, it's very obvious when you find a horned lizard scat because you break it open and it's just solid ant parts. There, there's nothing else in there, or very little of anything else in there. Um, the unfortunate thing about these invasive species is that they don't just affect the horned lizards or the ants, they affect everything. So except for some non-native insects that might move in like some aphids and things like that. Um, it, all of the, um, diver the diversity of um, spiders and beetles and all of those things go down with the invasive plants move in. So even if they could move to something else, there isn't something else to move to. Is there any indication for what is it about ants that the horned lizards uh, <laughs> like so much that that's their the only thing they seem to want to eat? Um, I it, I don't know that for sure. I mean they they're pretty spicy and some people like spicy food, so maybe that's it. I don't know. I'm I'm kidding. Um, it they're abundant. Their activity is relatively easy to track. They're not, they, they don't have the frenetic activity of other ant species. They're, they're very linear in, in the way they walk. And so the ants can just get onto one of these um, foraging lines and just pick off the ants as they're walking by without any very much effort at all. And, and remember that the horned lizards are really adapted to just sitting still most of the time. Because if, if they're moving, that's when the kestrel is going to see them or the shrike or the other 
bird of prey or something. So they don't want to be moving around a lot. They want to be sitting still. And the, the abundance and behavior of the harvester ants facilitates them to be able to continue to do that. All right, well, thank you uh, again. I want to thank uh, Dr. Barrows for sharing his knowledge and research uh, into the horned lizards uh, with us tonight. And thank you all for uh, being here and sharing with us. Um, and uh, encourage you folks to um, both make observations of horned lizards uh, for uh, iNaturalist or uh, when you're out there hiking, and also to keep your eye out on uh, new upcoming events and new, especially Wild Coachella lectures um, coming up. We've got a really good slate of uh, lectures coming up that we're really excited to share with you all and have you all get to participate in. So with that, I want to um, say stay safe and have a good night. Thank you.